That is The Postures, a track there called Alpha Male. And uh, Tiki, before that, with Bloodstone featuring Holly Smith, it's now 12 minutes past nine. The Radio Waymo Breakfast. Live from the New Scientist Labs, Janine Young, newscientist.com. Let's get our teeth into some science with Janine Young joining us in Melbourne City. Uh, good morning, Janine. Good morning to you. And first up, it's a story uh, that we've uh, covered a little bit before, but there's some more specifics now about what is going to happen to the coral reef as uh, global warming uh, continues. Yes, another one of these stories that I don't have any good news for you. It's it's a bit rough on a Thursday morning. I don't (laughs) tend to come out with anything positive. Indeed. Um, The bottom line is that there's been a conference this week called Greenhouse 2011, and they've been talking about everything to do with climate change greenhouse gases and the like. And there was a researcher whose name I know I'm going to mispronounce, so I apologise to him and to anyone else who knows how to pronounce it. Ove Herg Guldberg mm-hmm. is from the University of Queensland and he's been looking at how the, the Great Barrier Reef in particular, but coral reefs in general, are likely to be able to respond to increasing levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Now, just a little bit of background. We have talked about this a bit, little bit before, but it's worth sort of knowing before we move on. Oceans are very good at sucking up carbon dioxide. It's part of a, a balance that they, they try to keep it um, out of the atmosphere and the like. They suck it up. But the problem is that you end up with a slightly more acidic environment when the oceans do that. It's, kind of, it's a buffering mechanism, effectively. And it's basically starting to make things a bit more difficult for corals and for algae and for even fish. Um, another thing that came out of the, the conference this week is that um, fish have difficulty breathing, that their respiration underwater is harder in a, a, um, a slightly more acidic environment. Some of their navigation can be off. For some species, they can't decide what's a predator anymore. Mm. So there's, there's more effects than just on coral here. But as soon as you start getting this acidification, you end up with acidosis. And that has serious implications right across the reef because in conjunction with this more acidic environment, with warmer temperatures, corals are more susceptible to bleaching. So bleaching is when they get stressed, they expel the the algae that they need inside them to be able to produce food and the like, and then ultimately they die. I think a lot of us have seen the images of of bleached coral and it's, it's not a pretty sight. So taking all these sorts of things into account, Ove has been having a look at what the coral reefs around Australia are likely to be able to do. And indeed, across the world, this is a a fairly broad-reaching assumption. Yeah. Uh, Not an assumption, a finding. That's what I'm looking for. And the bad news is that it's very likely that within 10 years, we're starting to see our coral reefs dying off. That's unfortunately the bottom line. It was thought even six years ago that if the coral reefs were able to exchange their algae, uh, they were able to to exchange them for more heat-tolerant algae, that they'd probably be fine. And there was some evidence to suggest that this might happen. But now they think that's only likely to be about a quarter of all the coral reefs that actually have more than one species of algae in them already. And that leaves 75% that have one species, and therefore they're vulnerable. Unfortunately for any of these coral reefs to be able to migrate, and that can happen. You can actually get coral travelling on on currents and the like, and they can set up new reefs. But unfortunately, they would need to migrate at a rate of about 15 kilometres a year, and that's a lot, Mm. to be able to stay cool, and they just don't migrate that fast. So the bad news is that it's looking like we're going to lose our coral reefs within 10-odd years, if we can't do something about, and here it comes again, getting our carbon emissions down and attempting to cool the earth. But, uh, Bad news, but that's the bottom line. Yeah. So, so you're saying we've got 10 years to reverse. We'd have to reverse, not just cap, but we, we would have to reverse, wouldn't we, our, our emissions? Yes. Yeah. Yes. And, I mean, this is not fait accompli. Of course, you know, if we can say, make some big changes and we can actually find ways to be able to make the reefs more resilient and the like, then... We might have a hope, but the uncomfortable conclusion is that within 10 years we might start to see coral reefs dying off simply because oceans are too warm and they're too acidic. Even a change of 0.1 of a a pH unit is already making a difference and they're anticipating, and again this is from the conference the other day, that by the end of this century it's likely the pH is going to be 7.8. Pre-industrialisation it was 8.2. Wow. 
And that is actually, it doesn't sound like much, but in terms of, you know, the, the acidicness, acidity of the ocean, that makes a really, really big difference. So, and so can we see everyone in um, Queensland with a swimming pool um, over the next 10 years converting their swimming pools to kind of like coral incubators <laughs> or something? Because, you know, we're going to need some crazy thinking in order to try and keep some of this stuff alive. Absolutely. Uh, what do we do? I don't think people have answers to that yet, unfortunately. It's um, it's scary, although there is work going on on the Great Barrier Reef specifically mm. to try and build reef resilience so that it can actually deal with a lot of these sorts of uh, threats and issues a lot more readily. The other thing that you've got to bear in mind here is that climate change, and again, we've talked about this before, uh, warmer oceans mean that you're more likely to get more intense types of cyclones. Um, out of the conference this week, we heard there may be fewer of them, but they're likely to be more intense. So stressed reefs are going to be more uh, prone to any kind of cyclone that comes along. They're going to get hit a lot harder than they would have done if they were full and healthy and there was no stresses on them. So you, you've got all these extra factors working together mm. to mean that these reefs are potentially in real trouble. They're going to struggle in the next however many years simply because they have so many stresses being placed on them and they've taken thousands of years to get to the state that they're in and it could take 200 yeah and all of a sudden it's gone gone burger all right well um let's move on to the next story we've heard about scientists growing ears and livers and kidneys how about eyeballs janine Possibly. You, you, you can't say no to these things. Um, possibly so, yes. Researchers in Japan have been using embryonic stem cells to be able to try and make retinas. So that's, that's a specific part of the eye. Very important. Your eye can't function without it. Yeah. They've been able to, to grow it over a particular um, type of protein scaffold, a matrix if you like. But what's really good is these stem cells have been able to organise themselves into the six different types of cells that you need in a retina and they've been able to get the structure about right on their own. So this is really exciting because anything to do with stem cells means that they're starting off as kind of like a blank canvas and they need guidance to be able to form whatever organ you want them to form. Mm. They, they tend to just grow wild if you give them no direction. Be like children, really. You need to give them <laughs> borders and guidance and yeah. that kind of thing. Yeah. You know, go here, do this. Um, getting those triggers right has been really tricky for a very, very long time. Researchers are getting much better at working out how to do this now. And so if they can potentially find ways to get these cells to grow in correct directions to form things like retinal cells, then hopefully in time they might be able to grow enough of them that they might be able to transplant them into people that have had issues with their retina. And indeed, all sorts of things can go horribly wrong with the eye. Again, not telling people anything they don't know, but potentially in time, we might be able to do transplants wow. with these. Yeah, that'd be handy. I, I, I've heard about something recently called retinal tearing, uh, which doesn't sound very pleasant, does it? But it's where the retina basically falls off the back of the eye. Yeah, it, I think it's um, through a traumatic experience like car crashes and that kind of thing, if no, I know anything happen. about it, and I yeah. only vaguely do. Yeah, no, no, you don't want that. But to know that there could be something to make it better if you do, could be a bonus. Quite good, yeah. All right, well, that's nice to know, Janine. Thank you very much. <laughs> and uh, uh, we can find those stories, of course, in New Scientist magazine out next week and, of course, online as well, newscientist.com. See you, Janine. See you next week.